Bill Damon. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Always delighted to be here. So we had you on way back in 2017 to talk about your book, The Path to Purpose. And this is uh, about your research on where you look at how young people, adolescents, young adults develop their sense of purpose. You got a new book out called A Rounded Golf with My Father. And this is uh, both a exploration of a psychological concept that we'll talk about, life story, but it's also a memoir where you use this concept of telling or recreating life stories to explore the relationship or non-relationship relationship that you had with your father. So let's talk about this idea of, of a life review. What is a life review? Who developed it? And what are the benefits of, of a life review? A life review is a way to continue your development of purpose throughout the lifespan. As you mentioned Earlier, when we talked a few years ago, I had focused most of my work on young people developing purpose, adolescents, young adults. And I've since then become more and more interested in purpose throughout the lifespan. And one way to continue purpose learning, and it's always important to keep your purpose alive or to look for new purposes as you grow through adulthood and later in adulthood. And one way to do that is to Look back on your life, whatever you've done, and think about what the high points were, what the choices you made were, what the failures and regrets you have were, how you can learn from them, and how you can bring it forward to, first of all, understand who you are in the present and how you got there, but also to make choices about your future because you always have a future as long as you're alive. And The future means figuring out how you're going to change, how you're going to adapt to new conditions. And the point of the book really is that thinking positively about the future means that you really have to come to terms with your past, including including some of the regrets you have. And my book is full of uh, full of missed opportunities and regrets. A lot of them have to do with my relationship with my father or my non-relationship. And that's the story that I tell in the book, using myself as a case in point for this idea of purpose development throughout life. Well, so this idea of life review, this has been around for, since like World War II, you saw the beginnings of it with Viktor Frankl and his logo therapy. And then there's a guy named Butler who took the idea of finding meaning in your life by basically doing a life review. What was Butler's idea? Like, why did he think, okay, we're going to, you create this story about yourself and what was he hoping it would you'd be able to do with that. Yeah, was, Butler was an amazing person. He died in 2007. He was a psychiatrist and a legendary psychiatrist. He founded the National Institute of Aging. He wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book. He coined the term ageism, in fact. So he was a great figure, a great public figure. Early in his career, before he started, before he moved to the stage of being a public leader, he developed the method of the life review. And he developed that to deal as a psychiatrist with his patients that were battling depression late in life. And he figured the reason they were getting so depressed is that they were thinking about their pasts in the wrong way and in a very haphazard way, remembering the things that really stung them in the past and not getting over them and thinking, oh, gee, I made bad choices. If only my life had turned out this way rather than that way, or if only I'd made this choice rather than that choice, my life would be great. All of these kind of defeatist attitudes. And so he worked on a life review that was a systematic way of thinking back on your life, thinking about what was meaningful and purposeful. And everybody has those things. And also thinking about the idea that you wouldn't be the person you are now if you hadn't made those choices, even if the choices felt like mistakes at the time. And so it's a very compelling method. I am not a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist, and my book has nothing to do with depression, but it does have to do with attempting to cast a positive light on your life and making the best use out of your past memories that 
can prepare you for a hopeful, positive, and purposeful future. And I'll just say one more thing about this whole idea of looking back into the past. A lot of people say, well, gee, you know, I got to get over the past. It's kind of dead or it's, you know, why well, think backwards? Why not just look forwards? You know, the kind of don't look back attitude. But I quote Faulkner, and I think Faulkner was right on this. And the quote is, the past is not dead. It's not even past. It's part of who we are. And either we come to terms with it or we don't. But if we don't, we're going to be living for a long time with regrets and a kind of a disorganized and not even authentic view of who we are, how we got to this point, and where we should go moving forward. Well, I think a point that Butler made, and you make too, is that we're always telling stories to ourselves. Like Butler noticed that his patients with depression, they were telling a story to themselves. It was just, they weren't even thinking about it. And as a consequence, it was a story that you know, tended to go negative because they had that negativity bias. What he said, okay, if you're going to tell a story about yourself, we have to do that to develop ego integrity, to have a sense of self. Let's at least be a little bit more systematic about it. Yep. That's exactly right. Telling stories is a human, it's a feature of human life. And in fact, we tell little stories every time we take a trip to a store and come back and say, hey, I got a great bargain or some anything, even trivial little stories all the time. And that's natural and it's good. But in addition to doing it spontaneously, if you do it thoughtfully and intentionally and really go back over your life to take a look at, try to understand what was important to you in your past life and why does that matter and what meaning can that bring to your present and future life that can really give you a uplifting sense of who you are and and a lot of confidence moving forward when did you pick up on the idea of of life review would be useful to help people develop a sense of purpose and meaning because this is your area of work purpose and meaning when did you make that connection between the two ideas Yeah, well, intellectually, I made it through my work because I do read, of course, in the field of lifespan developmental psychology. And so I knew about Butler's work and about people like Dan McAdams, who's done landmark work on narrative identity. So I knew about all this, but I never really brought it home. What brought it home to me was the amazing discovery that my daughter led me to having to do with my father. And I use this as the case in point, I use myself as a case study in the book about how somebody in my early 60s, which is pretty late in life, uh, can transform a view of who you are and how you got to that place by doing the life review. And I was shocked into doing it by the revelation that my daughter came up with that my father, who had abandoned me at birth, was actually not a no-account scoundrel. He had a life and an interesting life. He was dead at the point that my daughter discovered this, but she came up with information that fascinated me and gave me a sense of who he was. And I did, at that point, the life review, including research on who he was and got to know him in absentia. And that meant a lot to me, and it really did fill in my life story. All right, so you're exploring your relationship with your father that was a way for you to put theory into practice. Well, let's talk about that a little bit, about your relationship with your father. So as a boy, you never knew your father. Growing up, what were you told? You know, what happened to your dad? That he died? That what was the story that you were told as a young man and that you believed until, you know, your 60s? Right. Well, my mom told me during my whole childhood and adolescence that, quote, my father was missing in World War II. That phrase was like a mantra. It was the only thing I ever heard. And whenever anybody asked me, where's your father? Who is your father? When I was in school, my friends, my teachers, I would repeat that mantra. He's missing in World War II. I assumed that meant he was killed in action. And that's actually on my school records, I found. When I was in college, my mother showed up in my college dorm one day and revealed to me that he was still alive. And in fact, she said he's been sending me $100 a month child support. And she felt maybe she should share that with me because I was, I had a scholarship to college and she wasn't contributing to my college expenses. I was kind of shocked. I 
thanked her for her generosity. I refused the uh, share of the child support. And the conversation lasted about a minute. She lived another 42 years, and we never discussed the matter again. I felt embarrassed. I, she was basically revealing that she'd hidden his existence from me for my whole childhood. But my, other, my attitude really was, well, okay, this guy abandoned me. He must really be an irresponsible cad. I don't want to know about him. I don't want to have anything to do with him. And so I refused in my mind to even think about him for the next 40 years or 50 years or 40 years of my life. And it was only when my own daughter got interested and started poking around in online archives and so on and came up with information that I kind of realized, you know, I can't just live my whole life in denial. And he's a guy that he's dead now, but I'd like to know more about him at that point. So uh, I began finding out what he was like at the point where my daughter made a phone call to me, a very consequential call saying, dad, I don't know if I should be telling you this, this might upset you, but I found out who my grandfather is and who your father is. And that got me hooked. And you noticed, you, you highlight too in your research, you've noticed this with a lot of individuals when they get to about your age, like their 60s, um, they, they take an interest in genealogy to figure out who they are. Like, what do you think is going on? What is it about that age in adult development that, I don't know, people feel nudged to, to research about their, their roots? Yeah, ex- exactly. It's exactly as we talked about earlier that people f- have a need to think about what's been important in their lives. And that need always comes up during any transitions, any important life transitions. Of course, it comes up when you graduate college and so on earlier. But later in life, when you, especially when you get to your 50s, 60s, and so on, a lot of things that you were committed to begin not necessarily going away, but be, begin to take less of your time. In my case, my children had left home and gone on to their own lives. And I'm not a micromanaging parent. I keep in touch with them, but it's not the same as when they're in your home. You begin thinking about retirement. And so a lot of the purposes that you have in life begin to become withdrawn. And you think about who am I and what am I going to do moving forward? I still have a lot of life to live. And I think that that's why people, the baby boomer generation, for example, of of which I am sort of part of, is so fascinated by their ancestry and by their own earlier life, because that's a way to construct how you got to this point and what is important for you, for your parents, and who you are. And, And not only who you are, this is really the main point, but who you want to be going forward, because we are always in a position to learn, to build new things in life, to reconstruct our lives, to develop our identity further in a positive way. And that's what keeps us alive. And we still have a lot of life to live, even when we hit our our 60s. So that's, I think, that's why people are drawn to this naturally. Yeah. It sounds like it's preparing you for that generative phase of life. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so the phone call from your daughter saying, "Hey, I, Dad, I found out some stuff about your dad. He he didn't disappear. He wasn't a scoundrel. He actually had a, a, an entirely different life on his own. And we'll talk about what that life looked at. And it sounded like his life was enriched, and he contributed to a higher cause than himself. Had his own family. So you, you find this out, and you're like, "Wow, I gotta I gotta explore this some more." So let's use this as a starting off point to talk about this life review process. And the first part is basically just collecting information to construct that story. How did you start that collection process? Well, number one, I got in touch with my father's still living relatives. He had a younger sister who was fortunately 12 years younger than him. So she was actually pretty vital in her maybe age 80 or something like that. And she welcomed me. I went to visit her. And she revealed a lot of stuff that opened new doors. For example, she revealed to me that he had gone to the same high school that I went to, a private independent school, that I had no idea how I'd even gotten there because 
I grew up in a not very advantaged situation. My mother was a single mother. Uh, we were not well off. And I, I never uh, understood how, how did I ever get to, this was Phillips Academy Andover, a wonderful boarding school. How in the world did I ever get there? Well, it turned out that my father went there and that's how my mother knew about it. And she arranged the necessary financial scholarship and so on. And that was a great educational experience for me, but it didn't just happen. So that's an example of how information can really change your view of, of who you are and how you got there. And of course, once I learned that, I could go back to the school. I dug up my father's old school records. I dug up my old school records in the archives. I could compare them, look for similar character traits, look for differences in how we approached our schooling. He was much less ambitious than I was and kind of irresponsible at that age. And his irresponsibility, of course, continued to when he abandoned my mother and me. And and as much as I wanted to learn about him and um, and found a pathway to respecting him because he had done some very positive things in his life, I still had to deal with how to forgive him for that act of irresponsibility of abandoning uh, my mother and me. And that was a crushing blow to my mother. And uh, for me, I had to figure out how it, how that made a difference in my life. And that was not simple because there were upsides and downsides to growing up without him there. Well, so you mentioned your your mother had passed away before you just start start on this you know exploration this life review. So how did you find out how she felt about or what she knew about your father abandoning you guys? You know, it was just in little bits and pieces and kind of a salvage operation. But I uncovered one amazing document. She had, of course, no pictures of him or any information and never talked about him. But when she died. Uh, I went through her belongings and she had one little memorabilia of him. It was a little note that he sent from the army from Germany. He was serving on the lines, uh, front lines in Germany in World War II. And it was a little note that he started the note, Dear Pie Face, a little note of endearment, I think, and how to get in touch with him. He was already married to her and that she had saved that that she had saved that among all her other things and that and that alone, all of those decades, it gave me a little sense of that she still had some feelings for him. And of course she chose to send her one and only child, me, to his same school, which again means that she found him admirable in some sense. So I guess the first step of you're trying to collect this information, talk to people, talk to, I mean, if your parents are still around, talk to them about their own lives and what they were like growing up or talk yeah. to their siblings. I mean, that would be like the step number one resource, correct? Right. And and let me just say that one of my regrets that I had to deal with is that I never did confront my mother or talk to her openly about this. And it was too late by the time I found out about my father to do that. And that was a missed opportunity. And I do write in the book, one of the lessons I learned is to have the conversations with your loved ones before it's too late. And another source of, of facts, so you can construct the story is, I mean, you actually, you go to places to get primary source documents about your father and yourself. Like you went to your old school and I was surprised. I didn't, I mean, I didn't, I guess this must be unique to Andover, but they had records for your father and for yourself, like notes from your teachers. Yeah. And and full, uh, especially for my father, full documents about the teacher's opinions about his character and all of that. Uh, some of that teachers don't even do these days. And I can't say which schools would have this, but it was pretty amazing to discover this. It was, it was a little bit like a Dickensian search, walking down dusty corridors and finding old file cabinets. And there was a wonderful archivist at Andover that helped me do that. But what I did find in not just the school records, I also looked from his military records. I went to the British War Museum. I went all over the place. And there's a lot of stuff around. You, you can dig up old records, some of it online, actually. Others, you have to actually visit places. And it's a lot of fun to be that I, I was a totally amateurish historian. I'm not trained as a historian at all, but it's, it's amazingly moving 
to open a file and discover a letter written, for example, by your grandparents to a school when they're upset because their son isn't doing a good job. It's one of the things I found. Uh, I'd never seen letters from my grandparents before. And to actually discover original documents in these old dusty files is, is really thrilling, especially when it's part of your family. And the useful thing about those documents, it's a third-party source. Because oftentimes you can ask your parents or an aunt or an uncle, you know, what was grandpa like? What was dad like? And they've got their story. But it's nice to have like a third party saying, well, no, here's how we saw it. And so it gives you a fuller picture of of that story. Yeah. And in the book, I write a lot about memory. And memory is misunderstood, I think. And that's why I spend time, time writing about it as a psychologist. Because a lot of people think memory is like a camera, you know, it takes a snapshot and it kind of resides there under the surface. And all you got to do is poke and see the picture. But that's not right. Memory is partly at least a construction. You, you have certain traces of things that happened and you fill them in with your own opinions and, and experiences since then. So a lot of times, if you do speak with your grandparents, say, or your great parents, they'll do their best to tell you stories. And that's great. You should do that and get their versions of things. But you should understand also that they're they're constructing a lot of the details themselves out of their feelings about what happened. And so it is very helpful to find other third sources, objective documents and historical records and so on to get the whole story and and to get the more accurate story because memory is never going to be 100% accurate. Besides checking it with third-party sources, like how do you do this internally? So you know, we've had a psychologist on to talk about the idea of cognitive dissonance. So it's the idea, you, there's like a tension where you did something, but that's that something you did doesn't match up with how you think of yourself. And so you'll do things to release that tension where you go, well, it wasn't that bad what I did. Or so how do you how do you avoid doing that as you're constructing this the story that you're like you're not creating a story that that's uh, I don't know soothing your ego, um, but it's <laughs> it's actually you're, you're you're getting the full story warts and all. Yeah, that's a great question, Red. You know, and that's the most challenging thing of all. That's the psychological challenge. And you're absolutely right. There are tendencies are to do all kinds of rationalization denial, bad away recollections that we don't like, that shed bad light on ourselves and so on. And you're absolutely right. This is a challenge and you you do have to kind of train yourself and steel yourself to try to take a really frank and honest look at what you did and how you made the decisions and mistakes that you made. We all make mistakes. Every human being makes mistakes. And so you have to, first of all, be forgiving to yourself and say, hey, I know I made mistakes. Of course I did. Everyone does. But I'm going to be honest and and try to really confront them, encounter them, admit to them. And then you look for what you can learn from them. You, You look for the lessons and how you can then deal with the regrets that you have because you made the mistakes. And I go, that that's a long story that I go into. I have a whole chapter in the book about dealing with regrets. I begin by quoting Frank Sinatra, uh, one of my favorite singers, who sang in his in one of his famous songs, regrets, I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. And I say, you know, that's a very uh, plucky attitude. And I always kind of thought that sounded sensible, but there's, it, there is a but there, which is that if you actually avoid really admitting that you that you have a number of regrets and and you just turn away from them you never really you never really learn to deal with them in a in a healthy way they're always going to be there and they're always they're always going to bug you in some in some sense and so it's really better to bring them out and to say okay i do have regrets and here's what they mean to me because we all make mistakes and not only that Part of it is understanding that sometimes the mistake you made put you on a path that now you've ended up a different uh, person, but that's okay. That's okay. The, it, it's fine that, you are, it, that you're not the person you would have been if you had not made that mistake. Yeah, you did this with your father. So you, you got this information, 
you got a picture of what your dad was like. And then you also got a picture of what you were doing this to yourself as well. You were talking to professors or getting records from your, your university, going back, look, reconstructing the story of how you got to where you're doing today. So you got a better idea of what your personality was like. And one thing you did is you sat and you're like, okay, well, it's terrible I didn't get to have a dad. But then you kind of sat down and looked at it. Well, knowing my personality, knowing my mom's personality, and knowing my dad's personality, I don't know, maybe things wouldn't have turned out the way they did if my dad hadn't have left. Uh, I mean, it was terrible that he left, but maybe it was good that he left. Yeah, I mean, realistically, I, I, as you said, I, I took an honest look at my own characteristics, his characteristics, my mother's characteristics, all of which I were revealed by this life review and looking through documents. And my father was a very easygoing guy. That was one of his strengths, but also one of his character weaknesses because he was, they didn't have this phrase back then, but he was laid back to a fault. He was, I describe him as an expert in not trying too hard. And my mother was the opposite. She was very focused and that's part of why she was able to get through this abandonment in a successful way eventually and have, she was had a a career, which was hard for a woman in those days. And I was more like my mother and also very stubborn. That's another thing I learned about myself in early years. There would have been domestic turmoil beyond belief in, in this family. If he had come back, he would have resented coming back. He was over in Europe. He was having a great time. He met a French ballerina who he fell in love with and divorced my mother and remarried. None of this excuses his irresponsibility in not coming back. But when I really took an honest look at it, I said, you know, my life turned out okay. I had a pretty good run and it was not easy. I had to learn a lot of stuff that young men have to learn without a father. And that was a challenge. But nevertheless, all things considered, I can't say I would have been better off if he'd been around. And in any case, there it is. It happened the way it happened. And I affirm my life. It's okay. And I think that's one example of how a life review can help you settle your resentments, deal with your regrets in a positive way, and end up feeling that the life I was given, I'm grateful for that. Gratitude really is one of the great end products of this. And it's very important to feel gratitude for the things you've been given in life. Yeah, so it helps you do that, live up with that Nietzsche talk about it, amor fati, love of fate, say yes exactly. to life, right? This is, yes. So besides helping you sort of deal with or manage regrets, things that, mistakes that happen in your life, the life review can also help you see how you've developed as a person. And you saw this in your father. So you had an idea, okay, first when you were a kid, it was like, well, he he died in the war. Well, no. Then it was, well, he abandoned me and he's just a a dilettante and he doesn't care about anything. But as you researched your father's life, you saw that this this is a a man, he had his faults, but he also had, he had some character development. What did you see there? And what's the benefit of seeing how you or another person can develop as a person? His character development really came about when he went into the military he enlisted early in World War II. He was a sophomore in college. He dropped out of college and joined the army. And that's when he developed his moral maturity. He was highly irresponsible in school and in college. And as I said, laid back to a fault. But once he got into the service, he developed some commitments. And one of the stories I tell that I dug up in my research is that he was a very courageous witness at a war crimes trial that a lot of the witnesses were being threatened and dropped out because they were afraid. But my father stuck with it. And there's evidence of his testimony. He wrote letters home. There were newspaper stories about his testimony. And he was really courageous on the side of the angels in that trial. He was ordered by General Eisenhower to be a witness at the trial. And Eisenhower comes across in the book, I did some historical research as really a great, great leader who really cared about the troops and so on. And my father rose to the occasion and was courageous and committed. And then he went on to a career in the foreign service, 
when he stayed in Europe, he stayed in Germany, he joined the War Department and then the Foreign Service, the State Department, and then the USIA. He spent years in Germany working to help reconstruct the country in a, in a pro-American way. And then he was stationed in Thailand, where he became a very significant diplomat. All of this showed commitment and patriotism and love of the country. And, and that's when he developed his strong character. None of it, again, excuses his irresponsibility and the way he hurt my mother, especially, and, and abandoned me. And that was also part of his early character, but he developed well beyond that. And I, I learned about that. And of course, this is my field. It's my profession to study these things. And I learned about that in a professional way that was fascinating to me. But it was also personally important to me because, as I said, it gave me a path to respecting him and to thinking, you know, he had a life of consequence. He also mentioned this one other thing that was important to me. He raised a couple of wonderful daughters who I have now gotten to know. And they're my wonderful half-sisters. And they're part of my family. I, I was an only child. I now have a couple of half-sisters who my father raised. And they're great people. So he contributed to the world. And I was very gratified to find out about that. When you've looked at your own life, and I mean, did you see any, have you seen any development in your own character as you've looked at your own life? Yeah. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've learned, uh, first of all, to become less stubborn and more open-minded and maybe even a little more courageous in thinking about my past, because I do think that there's a tendency, maybe all people have it to some extent, but I was certainly a, uh, an example of this, a tendency to shy away from things that are painful and difficult and that you just don't want to think about. And I've learned that that's not such a good approach. You really should confront your problems and, and open them up, and that's how you get over them. And so I, I think even fairly late in my life, I've had some character development towards open-mindedness and, and the courage to look honestly at, uh, at, my own, at my own mistakes also, because as I said, I should have, I should have had that conversation with, them, with my mother. I should not have avoided it and, other, other, and, and looked into other clues that came up along the way. Yeah, I think you had a college professor, like even notes from your high school teachers. They're like, I think they talked about your stubbornness. Like you had that was a problem even the, even way back then. Well, that's what that's how I it was revealed to me. I was kind of surprised, but when I thought about it, I said, "Hey, this is right." But that is an example of how a life review can give you insights into who you were, because I had forgotten all that, and or maybe not even been aware of it. But it clicked as soon as I as soon as I read that on my records that Bill Damon, you know, Bill Damon prides himself on being liberal and open-minded, but he's really very stubborn and bears right in when he gets an opinion or something like There's a quote, something like that. And I, I laughed and I said, oh my God, I was like that even at age 18. Holy cow. But I think this is this doing the life review and, and seeing the ways you have developed can really help people shift to that growth mindset. Because I think a lot of people, when they get older, they think, well, it was it William James said, like, we're kind of like plaster. And then once it's, it sets in your 20s and you can never change after that. But your research says, no, that's not true. I mean, there's some things that are stable over the lifetime, but you can make nudges and, and get better. And doing a life for you can, can show you that. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I love William James and I thought he was a great psychologist, but that's the old psychology. And, you know, that was over a century ago and he was wrong. We've learned that people can learn as long as the brain is still alive and character develops all through life. And that is part of what my research shows. And that is exactly the hope that I had in writing this book is encouraging people to say, you know, it's, it's not over till it's over. <laughs> and uh, people learn and grow all the way through life. And the way to do it is to be open-minded and curious and think anew about all the things. Don't forget your past by any means. Uh, don't have amnesia. Think about your past and think anew about what it, what it all means and, and who you are and who you want to be, because you still have agency over that. You have agency. You can, you can make choices that will give you a positive future. Well, going back to how a life review can help you figure out your purpose, can you define how you define purpose? And then 
how did doing a life review help you? I don't know, even, you didn't discover your purpose, but it, I guess it, it magnified, it really brought to light that, yeah, I did what I was supposed to do in this life. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Well, purpose, and I think our lab uh, really has been a leader in this developing purpose in, in a scientific sense. And we have a definition that we that we care about a lot because in science, you really want to define your terms. And the definition is that purpose is a long-term intention to accomplish something that's of consequence to the world beyond the self and meaningful to the self. And just in a sentence, take you through the high points of the definition. It means, first of all, purpose is a commitment. It's not a one-shot deal. You can do one-time things that are great, like jump in the river to save a drowning child, but you wouldn't say that's your purpose in life. That's just something you did. But purpose is a commitment to really accomplish something that you stick with. And it has to be meaningful to you. If somebody orders you to do it, that's really, again, not a purpose. Maybe you should do it. If somebody, if a teacher tells you to do homework, you ought to do it, but you wouldn't say that's my purpose. So it's something that's meaningful to you that you own, but it's also beyond the self. It, it's of consequence to the world. It's something, it's not simply meaning. It's not just reading a poem or going to a movie or listening to some music, all of which is great. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not diminishing any of those meaningful experiences, but they're not really purpose in the definition of the term because purpose is an attempt to accomplish something. Whether It doesn't have to be something heroic or noble. It can be raising a child. It can be contributing to your community in any, in any small way. But it is an attempt to make some kind of a mark or a difference in the world, humble, small, whatever. But it's something that you stick with, you're committed to, you care about it, it's meaningful. and you're trying to make a difference in a positive sense. And, and so when you looked at back on your life, did you start seeing your burgeoning purpose as a young man? Yeah, well, I tell a story in the book that I wasn't, I wasn't much of a student by the time I got to Andover at, at my mother's lead. But when I got there, I started writing for my school newspaper because I wanted to cover sports. I did love sports. I didn't have many other intellectual interests, but they sent me, I was not a good writer. And so they sent me to the sports events that nobody cared about. And one of them was a pickup game between our junior varsity, low status <laughs> soccer team. And soccer was the low status sport in those days. And a group of Hungarian immigrants who had just come over from Hungary because of the Cold War and the revolution there. And these kids, these Hungarian kids were so good because they played soccer and American kids didn't. And they wiped us out, our team out. And I hung around afterwards to talk to them. And they talked about how happy they were to be in America and uh, to enjoy freedom. Their parents didn't have to worry about being thrown in jail anymore uh, for political opinions. And they had aspirations, American aspirations. They were all going to get rich and you know, they just loved this country. And I thought about that and I had grown up, I think I was 14 years old at the time. I'd never appreciated being in this country or any of the freedoms. I didn't even think about it, but I wrote that article up for the school newspaper and my classmates read it and they all had the same revelation I did. Wow. And they talked to me about it. And at that point I got hooked on writing and in a sense doing research because that was what I did. I discovered this thing of, about these kids being happy. And even though they had nothing, they had no material. Their moms had packed them bacon fat and green pepper sandwiches. That's how little they had, but they were so happy and full of joy about being in this country. So that was where I kind of discovered the purpose of what I ended up doing for the rest of my life, which was doing research, writing about it, teaching, and finding out new stuff that could maybe contribute to people's lives. It, it goes back to that ninth grade experience I had writing for my school newspaper, writing for sports. Okay. So to recap here, life review, first part is like just the information collection phase. So talk to people is the number one thing. Get primary source documents about yourself or maybe your parents or ancestors. So call your mom. She probably has a tub with all of your elementary school report cards somewhere mm -hmm. in the attic. Yep. Ask for those, review that. And then 
basically you just look at it and you try to figure out, like find consistencies about your character, how things have changed and think about your regrets without, you're not trying to manipulate the story so you can soothe your ego, but yeah. you know, try to come to terms with it. And it's, it sounds like it's not a one and done thing. Is this like an ongoing process? Exactly, Brett. And you, you said it very well, including the last part, which is rigorously forcing yourself to confront stuff that maybe you, you wanted to forget all those years and figure out what the meaning of that is. And the other thing I'd say about it is that everyone needs to do it in their own way. I use the term ideographic uh, study in the book because it's very different than a typical psychological study where you look at groups of people and you have standard methods. This is the kind of thing that everyone has their own individual unique life. Everyone is a snowflake, everyone. And so everyone is going to have their own materials to look at, their own ways of talking to their relatives and friends and their own memories that they're going to have to confront. And so it's a highly individualistic process. I do not in the book give a cookbook method for this. I just describe the process and and what's important about it. But as I said, if people are going to do it, they need to adapt it just as I did to my own conditions in life. And of course, I adapted the method. I, I did not invent the method by any means. Robert Butler did. And I adapted his writings to my own situation. So the book's called A Round of Golf with My Dad. Did you ever get that round of golf with your dad? I did. It was an imaginary one. One of my new cousins sent me an old golf bag that my father had used when he was a kid. It was still hanging in the family garage, which (laughs) amazed me right there. And in the pocket of this little canvas bag was a scorecard from the Pittsfield Country Club in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. I managed to get a tea time with a very wonderful person that brought me on with him. And I played with my dad's scorecard in mind and kind of pretended that he was with me. He was a great golfer. That was one of the things I discovered. And that was one of my resentments because he never taught me how to play golf. And I love the sport, but I'm very modest (laughs) ability. And I played against his scorecard. And that was also a kind of a bonding experience in absentia between my father and me. Well, Bill, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? Well, they can go to the book. The book is, of course, available on Amazon and every other place that books are sold. So I I hope people will enjoy reading it. It's called A Round of Golf with My Father, The New Psychology of Exploring Your Past to Make Peace with Your Present. Well, Bill Damon, thanks for his time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Brad. I really enjoyed the interview. My guest today was Bill Damon. He's the author of the book, A Round of Golf with My Father. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Make sure to check out our show notes at aom.is slash life review, where you can find links to resources, where you can delve deeper into this topic.